Hello there. It's my privilege this evening on behalf of the Christians who gather at Almondville Gospel Hall to be presenting to you the final session in their series of ministry meetings reflecting upon the life of King David. Seeing that it is the last session, you'll not be surprised to understand that my subject matter are the final moments and the last words of David. Now, there are a number of places in Scripture where we, we find the final incidents of his life or the final words. For instance, we could have read this evening from 2 Samuel chapter 23. Or we might read 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and 29. We also have his final psalm recorded, which is Psalm number 72. And whilst I might be referring to one or other of these portions this evening, specifically the portion that has been allocated to me to consider with you are the first two chapters of the first book of Kings. Now, I won't be reading those chapters in their entirety. Let me just take some selected readings from there and fill in the gaps as we go along before we address some comments on the final moments of King David's life. So the first book of Kings and chapter number one commences thus. Now King David was old and stricken in years and they covered him with clothes but he got no heat. Wherefore his servant said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord, the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord, the king, may get heat. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel, and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king, and the damsel was very fair, and cherished the king, and ministered to him. But the king knew her not. Seeing that David was now old and stricken in years, maybe the oldest of his sons that were alive and remaining, Adonijah, saw an opportunity to usurp the throne. For the throne had been designated for Solomon. But Adonijah, maybe the oldest one yet alive of his sons, felt perhaps he was being served in justice. And so he schemed that he might take the authority and become king. This news came to Nathan, the prophet, and Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And they conspire together in verse number 11, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign? And David our Lord knoweth it not? Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel, that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto the king David, and say unto him, didst not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee, and confirm thy words." So a little pact was made between Nathan and Bathsheba to ensure that it would be Solomon that would succeed David and the usurper Adonijah might be foiled. And so the plan is put into action from verse number 15 onwards. Bathsheba uh, goes in to the king and the king says in verse number 16, What wouldest thou? Bathsheba responds in verse 17, she said unto him, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now behold, Adonijah reigneth. And now my lord the king, 
thou knowest it not. So Bathsheba presents her case. And then verse number 22, And lo, while she yet talked with the king Nathan, uh, with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen, and fat cattle, and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons, and the captains of the host, and Abiath of the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, and say, God save King Adonijah. But me, even me thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? Is this thing done by my lord the king, and thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king sware and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. And then Bathsheba bowed down with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord, King David, live forever. Then King David said, Call me Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and cause Solomon, my son, to ride upon mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there king over Israel. And blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne. For he shall be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And so the three men, Zadok, Nathan and Benaiah, duly go and anoint Solomon as being heir and successor to David upon his throne. This news came to Adonijah, and he feared for his life. And so he rushed in and caught hold of the horns of the altar and pleaded for his life with, with Solomon. And Solomon showed him clemency. And he says, in verse number 52, Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. And so King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, and he came and bowed himself to King Solomon, and Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. Then chapter number 2 begins with, The days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth, with all their heart, with all their soul, they shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Wise advice to King Solomon. And then David addresses how Solomon was to deal with three notable uh, characters or, or families in the case of Barzillai when he assumed 
authority in the land. And so a word is said with regard to how Solomon should treat Joab, the sons of Barzillai, and Shimei. But then we pick up in verse number 10. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron. And 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Then sat Solomon upon the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. And I trust that the Lord will bless us as we consider his good word together. You know, someone has said that death is often at once the close and epitome of existence. I thought that was very interesting. Death is often at once both the close and the epitome of existence. It is the index at the end of a volume. I thought that was an interesting way of reflecting upon the event of death. The index at the end of a volume. Now, as we approach the final scenes of David's life, we can take lessons from these events that would indicate that we find in this portion of his existence an index to his life as lived before. We have elements of the man that was being brought out in these final moments. For instance, we find in these verses that David had a weakness when it came to dealing with matters of family. That will come out and we'll reflect upon that a little. We also find that David shows traces of the bloodlust that had characterised his life. He was a man of blood in insofar as having shed much blood in the course of his life was concerned. But we also find another thing in these verses, and we find that David was a man consumed with a passion for the Lord's affairs. And that's a commendable thing. And as we go down through these verses, I'm sure we'll pick up uh, hints of that fact as we go along. Before we look at these verses under three headings, can I just bring to your attention this little event that transpired at the commencement of chapter 1 of the first book of Kings. This instance when David was old and stricken in years and his body got no heat. And so they brought in to lie in bed with him Abishag, this fair damsel, that there might be some body heat transferred. I recall Mr. Harrison, Geoffrey Harrison, saying many, many years ago that what was happening here was really an attempt to frustrate the will of God. I thought that was very interesting. You see, what they were doing was they were trying to keep David alive by artificial means. The time had come for the old man to die, but they were looking to prolong his life by the artificial means of bringing in this young maid to lie with him to give him body heat. And I recall Mr. Harrison saying, sometimes, you know, we can be guilty of trying to keep a thing alive when its time has come to die. Now, with some sensitivity, can I just put that out there for you to ponder? We perhaps are guilty betimes of keeping a thing going after it has served its useful purpose, keeping it going by forced or artificial means, whereby really its day is done. We've just been studying in the book of Zechariah a very interesting portion in chapter number 11. And it says in verse number 9 of Zechariah chapter 11, that that diest, 
let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. Now with some sensitivity, this might be a difficult point to absorb. But I do believe it is the case that sometimes God determines that a thing should come to an end. That that diest, let it die. A similar thing occurs in the Acts of the Apostles when when the uh, evangelists were to go into a place with the gospel and find resistance. God says, shake the dust from off your feet. They've had their opportunity. Now move on to the next place. And sometimes, can I suggest, there are practices that we should just cease perpetuating because they are useful, term of service has run its course. Now that said, we need to apply that principle with some discretion. After all, if they hadn't have brought this young maid in and kept David alive for a little longer, then this transferal of power may not have taken place in the way that it did. So good came out of that particular instance. So we aren't to be hasty to say, a thing has come to an end, let it die. But we do have to act with discernment because betimes that can be the case and we can be guilty of just keeping a thing going by artificial means when God would have us cease and move on to something else. I put that out there for your consideration. Now with the time that we have at our disposal, can I just abstract some principles out of the verses that we've read under three headings? We look at the transition of power and some of the lessons that come from that. We'll, we'll think of the charge that David gave to Solomon at the commencement of chapter number two. And then we'll think of the settling of old scores uh, in chapter two also. So firstly then, some thoughts around the transition of power. Adonijah saw an opportunity. It may very well be that uh, his opportunity was presented to him, so he thought, by being the oldest remaining son of David. And so he attempts to steal the throne where that throne had been designated for Solomon by the Lord. We perhaps get an indication of why Adonijah was so uh, forthright in, in trying to sweep to power by the words that are spoken in verse number six. It says, His father had not displeased him at any time, saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. Those words record that David hadn't been used to challenging the behaviour of Adonijah with the words, why hast thou done so? And it might very well be that Adonijah had been raised with a sense of entitlement, never having been refused maybe, or perhaps not often having been told, you can't have that, you can't do it this way. A little lesson in child rearing. It'll do nothing for the child if their every demand is met. There's no hardship in a child learning to deal with refusal. Because if a child is bought up spoiled, getting everything it requires or requests, then there is just the danger when that child transitions into adulthood, they do so with a sense of entitlement. I've got a right to it. Maybe Adonijah was such a character. He was, he was about to enforce what he saw to be his right. And actually, in his experience, David hadn't too frequently challenged him, why hast thou done so, son? 
a little word to those who have responsibility in bringing up children. The word no won't do them any harm now and again. But here's Adonijah, and, and he was looking to usurp the throne. But then there's a sad thing said in verse number 11. It's raised as a question presented to David. Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign? And David our Lord knoweth it not? That just indicates that David was losing touch with what was going on around about him. That's understandable. The man was elderly. He was 70 years of age and that was a, a, a large age in those days. And, and he was old. He was stricken in years. So it's to be understood that he's not just as sharp as once he was. But this is still a man who is in the position of responsibility. A man who, though he still was sat upon the throne, so to speak, as king, knew not what was going on around him. Well, that places the kingdom in a certain jeopardy. If the man in authority is out of touch with what is going on around him. Can I just utter a word to those who maybe have exercised overseership amongst the people of God for many a long year. It might be the case you arrive at a station in life whereby you're not just as tuned in to the events of the day and the need of the hour as once you were. That being out of touch places the company in jeopardy, that they won't get the leadership that they need. And so here's David, a man who is increasingly getting out of touch with what was needful in reigning and ruling amongst the people of God. But note this about David. He was a man who still did retain an interest in the Lord's work. You know, here in tell of Ad Adonijah's uprising, he might just have rolled over and said, I'm getting too old to worry about this. You sort it out amongst yourselves. And he might have just stood off the issue, but he didn't. Because he still had a passion for the Lord's work. And David was a man who understood that the Lord's work went on beyond his days. We'll come to that latterly. And he had an interest in the ongoing prosperity of the Lord's work. That is a large-minded man in my reckoning. The Lord's work doesn't begin and end with us, you know. The Lord's work goes on after our day. And David didn't detach himself and say, Look, I'm getting too old and frail. You've got to sort Adonijah out for yourself. No, he still had a vested interest in the Lord's things. And he knew full well, because we read in 1 Chronicles 28, the Lord had revealed it to him. Solomon was his designated successor. So David was going to labour with what energy he had left to ensure that the Lord's will be done and Solomon come to the throne. I think that's tremendous. Tremendous in a dying man, a man whose useful days had run their course, tremendous that he still had an interest in the ongoing prosperity of the Lord's work. Notice, it's good stewardship to hand a thing over in decent fashion. David was interested that the transition of power go smoothly, and that's good stewardship. And so David ensures that the thing be worked out that sees Solomon come to the throne, his throne, mark you. He wasn't precious. We read of it uh, there in 1 Kings and chapter 1, verse 33 onwards. We read of it that David was fully prepared while he was yet alive 
that Solomon sit upon his mule, that Solomon sit upon his throne, that Solomon reign in his stead. And David wasn't precious about retaining position. He was accepting of the transition of power to the younger man. That's a broad-minded man. That's a man who has paramount in his mind the success of the work of the Lord moving forward after his time. I trust that we appreciate that, that the Lord's work, it doesn't end with me. And me passing it on in decent fashion is actually part of my responsibility. And so we have in these verses lessons that can be drawn from the transition of power. We also read some very interesting things that David charges Solomon at the commencement of chapter number two. He passes on a word of advice. It says, the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying. And here's David's final word of advice to Solomon. What does he say? He says, I go the way of all the earth. What a sad, pragmatic phrase that is. He understood that his days were done, but he wasn't remorseful. He was rather positive, right to the end. And he says, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore. Oh, he knew. He knew that Solomon, who at this point in time could have been a very young man, he knew that he had to show strength. Being in testimony for God always takes fortitude, takes strength of character. The forces of this world are arraigned against the administration of the Lord's affairs. And, and those who engage in maintaining testimony and representing the claims of our Lord need resolve in the face of such contrary opposition. David knew full well that Solomon had some, some ripe characters that he had to deal with. And so he needed to be strong. Paul realises that was a requirement for Christians when he wrote to the church in Corinth. In his first letter, on chapter number 16, Paul will say, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. That has an echo of the advice that David was giving to Solomon in chapter number 2 of 1 Kings. He says, Be strong, and show thyself a man. That's what he said to Solomon. That isn't referring to gender. Mark you, we live in a day when men, in terms of gender, need to show themselves as men. And women, mark you, in terms of portraying their agenda, need to exhibit feminine qualities. We live in a day when Gender is being blurred amongst men and women. And the Bible would have men be men and women be women. And so David says to Solomon, be strong and show thyself a man. Not speaking about his gender, speaking about his character. Be manly is what effectively David was saying to Solomon. But not only did he have a word with regard to the, the fortitude of his character, he also says, keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments and his testimonies. David knew if Solomon was to be effective as a king, then he would need to rely upon the word of God for guidance. Nothing's changed. If we are to be effective in representing in this scene our risen Lord, then we must make recourse to the guidance of the Word of God. 
Solomon needed to know that. And paramount before his eye should be the statutes, the testimonies, the commandments, the judgments of the word of God. He should keep the word of God. Insofar as he was concerned, it was as it is written in the law of Moses. And then there's a condition placed upon that. If he were to keep these things, it was that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. And so he was to keep the word of God to ensure prosperity in the nation and in his reign. It wasn't just advice that David gave to Solomon. When we read in 1 Chronicles in chapter 28, we also find there that he provided the material for the building of the temple. That wasn't going to be David's responsibility, though he would have loved to have built the temple. The Lord said, because he had shed so much blood, he wasn't going to be that man. It would be Solomon after him who would build the temple. David didn't throw his toys out of the cot and say, well, I'm having nothing to do with the affair then if I can't build it. No, no. David provided the material that allowed Solomon to build a house for God. In that chapter, not only do we find that he provided the material, we also read that he provided the pattern for which Solomon should adhere to in building that temple. So he provided not just sage advice for his successor, he provided the material for building and also the blueprint that he should follow in that construction activity. I think there's a good scriptural principle there for we who have responsibility of informing and equipping a succeeding generation. Not only should we utter wise words of advice, but we should provide material that they can use for themselves in their day, in their building activity. And we should lay before them the pattern to follow. Again, that's what Paul did. He writes to Timothy, and he says, hold fast the form of sound words, the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 13. He, he not only gave advice to, to Timothy, he gave the pattern to follow. And so too we, for succeeding generations coming behind us, we need to present to them material that they can use in building Words of advice, yes, but also a clear outline of the pattern that they should be following in building for God in their particular day. And so there's a charge given to Solomon in the first four verses of 1 Kings in chapter number 2. Not only do we have lessons about transition of power and the charge that was brought to Solomon... We also have David speaking about settling of old scores. Now, this is very interesting. He brings before Solomon's attention three matters that he would like addressed by Solomon when he comes to the throne. And they relate to three men, Joab, Barzillai, or more particularly the sons of Barzillai, and Shimei. Of Joab and Shimei, David makes a very similar request. He says in verse number 6 of Joab, Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. That's his word to Solomon with regard to Joab. When it comes to Shimei, he says a very similar thing. Verse number 9 now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his whore head bring thou down to the grave with blood. 
And so David is asking Solomon to execute judgment upon Joab and Shimei. But this is not a man who's had the the red mist of bloodless descend over him. Because between the words concerning Joab and Shimei, we have his request with regard to the sons of Barzillai. And it's very measured. It's not the word of a man who's enraged. It's the word of a man who's very rational in his thinking. And he says, Show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. So when we are reading these words, we aren't to think of David as being overwhelmed with some vengeful spirit. No, he's very balanced in what he's laying to Solomon's charge, both with regard to Joab, who was a violent man, and Shimei, who was a very disrespectful man to David. Why is David laying these matters before Solomon to deal with? Well, it is, I judge, that Solomon, right at the outset of his reign, exercise righteousness. You see, Solomon is a lovely picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he shall reign in this scene in the coming day. And one of the overriding and initial characteristics of the reign of Christ in this scene will be that he will deal in judgment right from the outset. He will establish his reign in righteousness. And David says to Solomon, Now these matters I haven't been able to deal with in my day because a pardon issued by a king held good during the reign of that king and it was the responsibility of the succeeding monarch to judge whether that pardon be extended or whether judgment be issued. And so David says, after my day, these cases need to be opened back up and the the dreadful deeds of a Joab and a Shimei, they need to have executed righteous judgment upon them. I think that that fills out the picture very delightfully of the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes back to earth to reign, will not overlook indiscretions that have gone unjudged to that point in time. No, he will establish his reign in righteousness with judgment when he comes back to this earth. I rather think that's consistent with Psalm 72. That last psalm that David wrote, it's a psalm for Solomon, his son. And it speaks about his prayer for how Solomon should reign. And in verse number two, his prayer was that he shall judge thy people with righteousness. When we read Psalm 72, we can't help but think that those words extend beyond Solomon and they are fulfilled by great David's greater son, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ in a coming day. And so here we have some lessons then from the final moments of David. Lessons in how to successfully undertake transition of power. Charges given to his younger son, Solomon, who would take on a massive responsibility, keep to the word of God, and a settling of old scores, so that that reign of his successor be established in righteousness. And so it says in one Chronicles and chapter number 29, David, he died in a good old age, full of days, riches and honour. And so he did. And the word of God says in Acts chapter 13, David was a man after mine own heart, says the Lord. Shall we just pray? And Father, we do thank thee for the record that we have in holy writ of such a life. A life that had many downs as well as many high moments. 
And Father, we pray that we might reflect upon the life of David and realize that he was just a man of like passions as we are, and we are prone to the same kind of failings. And Father, we pray that we might understand from David how we should respond to failure in our lives with repentance, with remorse, and understand the forgiveness and the recovery of our God. We thank thee for a life lived for our example and all that we might learn from it as we try to live for God in our day and age. We trust that this word might be blessed to all that listen to it for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.